Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, today we are going to discuss a very important topic, uh, malignancy of the uh, ovary, malignant ovarian tumors. Uh, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to uh, enumerate the different pathological types of malignant ovarian tumors, understand specific criteria for each type, analyze the different methods of early diagnosis of high-risk cases and diagnosis of established cases, interpret spread surgical uh, staging and the proper treatment plan according to a specific type. I started my lecture with some of clinical scenario. Uh, please try to summarize each clinical scenario. And based on your uh, knowledge now, try to choose the answer from these suspected five answers. And then after the end of my lecture, you'll be able to uh, uh, correct or to choose the proper answer confidently, confidently I'm sure. Uh, this will help you to be concentrating in uh, every uh, word said and try to correlate it with your clinical scenario. Uh, select the ovarian tumor from the following list that's most likely to be associated with clinical picture. Each later option may be used once, more than once, or not at all. Granulosa cell tumor, certainly leading cell tumor, immature teratoma, des germinoma, Krokenberg tumor. The first clinical scenario, 26 years old. Please, when you are confined with a clinical case, it's very important to uh, concentrate on the age group of the patient. And then from the summary you put, try to correlate the instance of these possible pathology that you are going to diagnose in relation to age. 26 years old, grade 2 part 1, present, with, present to the gynecologist complaining of increasing hair growth on her face, chest, abdomen, uh, but hair, uh, hair on her head is <coughs> receding in temporal region. She also had uh, problems with acne. On physical examination, the patient has significant amounts of coarse dark hair on the face, chest, abdomen. So the, this patient has manifestation of androgen excess. On pelvic examination, she has an adnexal mass. Adnexal mass, androgen excess, 26 years old. The second clinical scenario, 56 years old presented by postmenopausal uh, bleeding. Uh, her uterus is enlarged with an external mass and she is known to have endometrial carcinoma. Then 67 years old women found to have bilateral adnexal masses while she was undergoing uh, evaluation for recently diagnosed colon cancer. <clears throat> uh, 17 years old uh, uh, female uh, referred to her primary care physician for evaluation of primary amenorrhea. On physical examination, there is evidence of realization, pelvic mass or adnexal mass, and chromosomal mosaicism in the form of 45X Turner syndrome and 60 and 46XY cells. Abnormal gonads. 19 years old uh, women undergoing diagnostic laparoscopy for 9 centimeter right ovarian mass. The final pathology report shows evidence of glial tissue, immature cerebellar, and cortical tissue. Uh, seven, 51 years old menopausal uh, women undergoing exploratory laparotomy for bilateral adnexal masses. Fusion section is performed on the excised ovaries and shows significant number of signet cells. Signet ring cells based pathognomonic for a certain type of malignant ovarian tumors. Uh, the last one is summary of most of our lecture today. 62 years old, Paris woman, complaining of a three months history of weight loss, abdominal bloating, uh, unable to eat much without indigestion. So, the, so this woman has upper gastrointestinal uh, upset. On examination, she's okay. Uh, she has abdominal uh, enlargement. Uh, based on this clinical finding, the physician suspects a gynecologic malignancy. What is the most likely diagnosis and what's your plan for proper management, including investigation and treatment? Uh, start with other topic, classification of malignant ovarian tumors. You know that we have three different types of 
uh, cells present within the ovary. We have the epithelial cells covering the uh, surface, the external surface of the ovary. We have germ cells from which the oocytes are formed, and we have the connective tissue, including six cord stromal cells. We have epithelial cells. These can be differentiated uh, into all different types that can differentiate in different parts of the body. So, with the development of abnormal growth, they can give rise to serous adenocarcinoma, mucinous adenocarcinoma, endometroid adenocarcinoma, or undifferentiated adenocarcinoma. Undifferentiated includes clear cell and transitional cell type of adenocarcinoma. Germ cell tumors are classified into death germinoma, endodermal sinus tumor, or your sac tumor, uh, choriocarcinoma, and teratoma by its two types. Six cord stromal tumors, granulosa cell tumor, fecal cell tumor, uh, fibroma, uh, fibrosarcoma, I mean, and the sertoliolytic cell tumor. Fibrosarcoma, fibroma is a benign tumor. We are speaking about malignant ovarian tumors. Here, this is the illustration of the three types of malignant ovarian tumors. I start with epithelial ovarian tumors. What are the characters of this type of tumor? This represents 60 to 70 percent of all ovarian malignancy. 90 percent of them are malignant. These are diseases of old age. The malignant epithelial tumor is a disease of old age. Characteristically, some cases may show elevation of CE125, and so it is very important prognostic factor for diagnosis for uh, follow-up of cases. It's not important for diagnosis. Other cases may show elevation of uh, cancer antigen 19-9 or uh, HE4 or carcinoembryonic antigen uh, tumor marker. Uh, these type of tumor are usually characterized by rapid rate of growth, late diagnosed, and so it is usually a poor prognosis and a very important specific character for malignant epithelial ovarian tumors. They are chemosensitive. All malignant epithelial tumors are chemosensitive. This is very important. Whether it could be used as adjuvant treatment with surgery or palliative treatment for uh, resectable cases. What are the etiology of these malignant epithelial ovarian tumors? Two important etiological factors. Reproductive factor, the process of frequent irritation of the cortex by frequent ovulation. And so it is very common in patients with low parity or nulliparity with infertility. And repeated intake of stimulatory drugs are at risk for development of malignant epithelial ovarian tumors. Hereditary and genetic factor. 5 to 10% of epithelial ovarian tumors occur in women with hereditary predisposition. And we found that women with hereditary predisposition of malignant epithelial ovarian tumors usually are of young age. And this tumor is usually the tumor suppressor gene, breast cancer gene 1 and breast cancer gene 2. Gene mutation of these two important suppressor genes are the, uh, uh, the basic for the abnormal cell growth and the development of malignancy. Three types of familial ovarian cancers are identified. Site-specific ovarian cancer syndrome, 15% of cases, the abnormal growth and malignancy will develop only in the ovary. Or hereditary breast cancer, hereditary breast ovarian cancer syndrome, and this is the majority of cases, breast and uh, ovary, in 75% of cases. Or cases with hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, the patient can experience any malignancy in the breast and the endometrium in the ovary in the colon uh, due to the presence of non hereditary non polyposis uh, colorectal cancer syndrome, and this is present in 10% of cases. So, uh, there are groups that increase the risk for these malignant uh, epithelial ovarian tumors, including advancement of the maternal age, nulliparity, infertility early menarche and late menopause, so wide uh, duration of ovarian stimulation, wide trace, history of other cancer, as we mentioned before, and the family history of other malignancies. History of other cancer in the same patient or family history of other malignancies, as we said. 
Uh, however, on the other hand, the multiparity, prolonged lactation, prolonged use of oral contraceptive pills reduce the risk together with tubal ligation and hysterectomy. Why tubal ligation and hysterectomy reduce the risk of malignant epithelial ovarian tumor? <coughs> they found that the use of irritant material uh, as uh, uh, vaginal disinfectant or vaginal uh, uh, substance could result in uh, arrival of this irritant material to the ovary through the tube that could be a cause for abnormal uh, stimulation and irritation of the surface epithelium, like talc powder, for example. Macroscopic picture of the malignant uh, epithelial ovarian tumor, uh, usually solid, however, may be partially solid, partially cystic. This could be seen by ultrasound and could be palpated during abdominal examination of the mass. Both are subjective, but abdominal examination is more subjective, but ultrasound uh, tends somewhat into more objectivity based on the character of the uh, uh, image seen. Unilateral or bilateral size, extremely variable, could be small in size or large in size. Uh, usually the malignancy, any malignant mass, the cut sec section shows areas of hemorrhage and necrosis because of the abnormal uh, abnormal growth and abnormal proliferation. Early stage of tumor, usually the capsule is intact, while late advanced stage capsule is usually penetrated by the abnormal growth of the malignant tissue. Microscopical picture of malignant epithelial ovarian tumors, adenocarcinoma. Malignant epithelial tumors are adenocarcinoma, either serous, mucinous, endometroid or undifferentiated as we said. Serous represent serous adenocarcinoma, 50% of cases. Mucinous, 20% of cases, both are bilateral. Endometroid, 30% of cases, and usually it is associated with malignant, uh, endo malignant uh, <coughs> endometrial cancer, endometrial malignancy. Any, uh, any type of this could be either well differentiated intermediate differentiated or poorly differentiated. Well differentiated grade one in which all the malignant abnormal proliferating cells uh, resemble in histological uh, nature or histological character as the same original cells from which they arise. Poorly differentiated, the malignancy is formed of solid sheets of masses, solid sheets of cells that completely different from the original cells in the lamina. Intermediate differentiated part of the tumor is differentiated to resemble the original cell and part solid sheets of completely undifferentiated cells that has nothing to do with the original cells from which they arise or develop. <coughs> Malignant germ cell tumor uh, represent 20 to 30 percent of all malignant ovarian cancer and 5 percent of them are malignant. They are classified, as we said, this germinoma, endodermal sinus tumor, choriocarcinoma, and malignant teratoma, either malignant transformation of benign cystic teratoma or malignancy from the start, which is said immature teratoma. What are the special features of this germ cell tumor? Malignant germ cell tumor of the ovary is a disease of young age. It's not old age like that of epithelial disease of young age. This is very important. The commonest predisposing effect which is the presence of abnormal gonads. So usually this girl, young girl, is that will develop uh, germ cell tumor, malignant ovarian germ cell tumor. Uh, this uh, in, 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 in great percent of cases have underlying or has underlying abnormal gonads. Most tumors produce substance in the circulation and they can be used as tumor markers. Most of these germ cell tumors are radiosensitive. However, chemotherapy may be uh, effective in early stage of the disease. Conservative surgery is very important. We said that this is a disease of young age. So uh, preservation of fertility is, is of great concern. Conservative surgical treatment should be the first line of uh, treatment if uh, it is possible. And so early diagnosis is very important to allow this conservative line of treatment to be used in a girl, a young girl, that wanted to preserve her fertility. This germinoma, the commonest malignant germ cell tumor, accounted for about 30 to 40% of all malignant germ cell tumor. 
It represents 1% to 3% of ovarian cancer. Tends to occur at young age, about 10 to 20. 5% uh, with abnormal gonads. So 5% with of this dysgeromenoma has underlying abnormal gonads, either gonadal dysgenesis or uh, testicular feminization syndrome, upon which a gonadoblastoma develops. So when you diagnose a woman, a girl with testicular feminization syndrome or androgen insensitivity syndrome, you should tell her parent that this patient should undergo gonadectomy as early as possible to prevent the development of underlying malignancy, germ cell malignancy for these abnormal gonads. Uh, may secrete alkaline phosphatase or lactic acid dehydrogenase. Yes, so if you ask for lactic acid dehydrogenase or alkaline phosphatase, they may be elevated in germ cell tumor of the ovarian malignancy. Uh, gross picture, this solid ovarian tumor, usually small or moderate in size, bilateral only in 10% of cases, grayish lobulated surface with tendency to hemorrhage and cause all malignancy uh, masses, shows hemorrhage and cause in the cut section. And this dysgeminoma specifically has early lymphatic spread to the pelvic and paraaortic lymph nodes. Early lymphatic spread, and histologically, they are characterized by the presence of lymphocytic infiltration. So it's radiosensitive, characterized by early lymphatic spread, and shows lymphocytic infiltration. Uh, on microscopic picture, germ cells show small, rounded, abundant cytoplasm and a large vesicular nucleus, abnormal nucleocytoplasmic ratio. It is present in most of the malignant tissue. Overproliferation and growth of the nucleus because of the abnormal mitotic changes. And, and these usually uh, go on the expense of the cytoplasm, so there is abnormal nucleocytoplasmic ratio. Uh, the line of treatment for this, as we said, surgery, early cases with intact capsule, usually pass to unilateral salpingo or phorectomy. Uh, if there is positive uh, peritoneal cytology, we may uh, complete her treatment with radiotherapy and then follow up once the patient completed her uh, fertility or there is any risk of uh, recurrence or residual malignant tissue, we may go to total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral cell binge of rectum. And removal of the rest of the gynecologic organs. Second type of germ cell tumor is endodermal sinus tumor. This prevalent, prevalent in young age, median age from 16 to young age group to 18 years old, they secrete alpha fetoprotein that are used as a tumor marker. Uh, pathology, they are characterized by small solid tumors, almost always unilateral. Endodermal sinus tumor, small cell tumor that almost always unilateral. Microscopically, it's characterized by the presence of what's called Schiller Duval bodies. These Schiller Duval bodies are cystic spaces in which there are glomerulus like structure having a central vascular core. Usually as this germinoma, unilateral salpingo or phorectomy, especially if the case was early diagnosed, if there is infiltration of the capsule or advanced stage of the disease, we will go to total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo or phorectomy. If there is any residual masses, we can go to chemotherapy as the tumor is chemosensitive. This germinoma was radiosensitive, but endodermal sinus tumor is chemosensitive especially in early stage. This is a chiller duval bodice. The microscopic picture shows the chiller duval bodice. The last type of uh, germ cell tumor of the ovary is malignant teratoma. We said either it is a malignant transformation of benign cystic teratoma or from the start it is immature teratoma, which is highly malignant tumor. Solid teratoma in 1% of ovarian teratomas below the age of uh, 15 years old, uh, usually unilateral solid tumor and forming mainly of immature neural tissue. Malignant transformation on, uh, of a benign cystic teratoma usually occur in postmenopausal women and forming of squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, 
the last type choriocarcinoma produce a non-gestational choriocarcinoma of the ovary produce human chorionic gonadotrophy. Uh, the last histologic uh, category of malignant ovarian tumors is six core stromal tumor abnormal cross of the stromal cells forming the ovary, either granulosa cell tumor, and here the tumor is functioning, specifically producing estrogen. So usually there is manifestation of feminization according to the age in the form of abnormal bleeding, in the form of precocious puberty if it occurs in a young age group. If the tumor arises from the sertoli cell tumor, the tumor will be functioning, producing androgen. Six cord stromal tumors arise from non-functioning or functioning stromal ovary. Arise from the functioning stroma, granulosa cell or sica cell, or sertoli lidic cell. Uh, non-functioning part of the ovary, it will give rise to fibrosarcoma. Granulosa cell tumor usually unilateral, solid, yellow, or yellow, uh, gray in color. They are functioning, producing estrogen, and sometimes inhibin. Associated with endometrial carcinoma from over-estrogenic stimulation, uh, it may develop into endometrial carcinoma or endometrial hyperplasia, commonly associated with endometrial hyperplasia, up to 50% of cases, or up to endometrial carcinoma, up to 10% of cases. They may secrete irregular bleeding. They may cause irregular bleeding or precocious puberty according to the age group or the patient develop these uh, abnormal growths. Microscopical picture, these cells arranged in different pattern called coal exner bodies, you see, cystic spaces surrounded by granulosa cells in a rosette-like space. Usually the tumor is unilateral, so the treatment either if we can reserve fertility according to the situation, according to the staging, uh, unilateral cell benjophorectomy or total abdominal hysterectomy or bilateral cell benjophorectomy. And specifically in the six cord stromal tumor, there is no place neither for radiotherapy nor for chemotherapy. So the six cord stromal tumor was, uh, six cord stromal tumors is neither radiosensitive nor uh, chemosensitive as we said. Epithelial tumor was chemosensitive. Germ cell tumor was radiosensitive. These six cord stromal tumor neither radiosensitive nor chemosensitive. So no place for irradiation or chemotherapy. Sertoli lytic cell tumor, they are very rare, representing less than 0.2% of ovarian tumors, usually small unilateral solid, and characteristically, these sertoli lytic cell tumor have low-grade malignancy and almost unilateral, like endodermal sinus tumor was almost always unilateral. Uh, treatment either by salvangiofrectomy if the patient is young and intact capsule. Okay? I hope to understand the different pathological uh, criteria of the uh, different classification of malignant ovarian tumors. Now, how they will uh, behave on spread? How malignant tumors uh, could spread? There are four main types or four means, uh, four different uh, route of spread of malignant ovarian tumor, which are very important. The first one is transcelomic spread, exfoliation. Uh, as a rule, during surgical exploratory laparotomy of malignant ovarian tumor, you should uh, provide a cytological element of the endometrium, of the, uh, of the peritoneal cavity, sorry, cytological element of the peritoneal cavity, either by aspiration of acetic fluid or radiotherapy. If there is no ascites at the time of laparotomy, you will do what's called the peritoneal wash. Cytology is very important. Why? Because the first route of spread for malignant ovarian tumors is transcelomic spread, exfoliation. Once the malignant cells uh, get an access to the peritoneal cavity, they will exfoliate and implant on the surface, giving rise to stage 3 of the tumor. And so transceromic spread is very important, the very root of spread of malignant ovarian tumor. And so you should get a peritoneal cytology during surgical exploratory laparotomy of malignant ovarian tumor. 
Then direct extension can go to anywhere, as you see, to the tube, to the endometrium, to the other pelvic organs, uh, lymphatic spread to the para, aortic lymph nodes, to the pelvic lymph nodes, internal iliac, common iliac, external iliac, uh, and then hematogenous spread. So ex uh, exfoliation or transceramic spread, direct spread, uh, lymphatic spread, and then hematogenous spread. Uh, this was the primary malignant ovarian tumors and their mode of spread. We have metastatic ovarian tumors. Also, these are a group of malignancy which are very important and uh, uh, half of them are very aggressive. They represent 5 to 6 percent of all ovarian tumors. Uh, the primary may be, in case of secondary, uh, metastatic tumor of the ovary, the primary could be either in the genital organs or extragenital organs. Genital organs could be, as you see, endometrial carcinoma, could be in the uh, tube or contralateral ovary, the other ovary. Extragenital come from stomach, from the colon, from breast, biliary, thyroid gland, and gland elsewhere. When the primary is from the stomach or from the pylorus, this is called Krukenberg tumor. So Krukenberg tumor is a type of metastatic ovarian cancer in which the primary is extragenital in origin. It is not genital uh, in, or in origin. This Krukenberg tumor account for 30 to 40 percent of metastatic cancer to the ovary. The primary is usually in the pylorus. However, less commonly in other is pressed colon or biliary tract, but commonly in the pylorus. Uh, they are bilateral solid ovarian tumor, usually reaching large size, retaining the shape of the ovary. Uh, the main interest is in its histogenesis, uh, which is pathognomonic, characterized by the presence of signet ring cell. The most acceptable theory is that by which the secondaries reach to the uh, ovary is retrograde lymphatic spread. How the malignant cells transfer from the pylorus to reach to the ovary by retrograde lymphatic spread. And this is specific pathognomonic feature of uh, Krukenberg tumor is the presence of signet ring cells. Uh, usually, this type of tumor is of bad prognosis. The patient dies within one year because most of the region are discovered uh, until the primary disease is advanced. Uh, what is the, the mode of uh, spread from the pylorus to the ovary, retrograde lymphatic spread? So usually the primary tumor is advanced, lymphatic spread to the extent that retrograde from the paraortic lymph nodes, the malignant cells reach to the ovary. So it's usually a very bad prognosis and usually late diagnosed. What is the clinical picture of primary malignant ovarian tumors? Uh, as we said, in most of cases, the epithelial tumor is uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent of cases, and so usually it is of a disease of old age, and was found to be common in industrial countries. Okay, symptoms, early symptoms of the disease are non-specific. Usually, either upper gastrointestinal tract symptoms, usually non-specific. Uh, however, in later stage of the disease, there may be abdominal pain, cachexia, or ab pelvic abdominal uh, swelling, abnormal uterine bleeding if the tumor is functioning or if there is associated primary in the endometrium. Uh, rarely, ascites may be the first clinical pre presentation in advanced stage of the disease. So usually, when it is diagnosed by symptoms, usually it is uh, in a late stage. Clinical picture of primary malignant ovarian uh, tumors as the word physical signs. So symptoms, usually early stage, non-specific symptoms, upper gastrointestinal tract abnormalities in the form of nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, abdom uh, indigestion. Usually they are non-specific symptoms. Later on, may start to develop abdominal mass, uh, vaginal postmenopausal uh, bleeding, uh, abdominal distension due to ascites according to the stage. Uh, physical examination, the most important physical sign is palpation of a pelvic 
mass. If the patient is likely, and this pelvic mass was early diagnosed by routine transvaginal ultrasound or accidental uh, screening for uh, other uh, for other condition, uh, this uh, can be uh, very helpful in early diagnosis of such cases. In late cases, a very abdominal fixed solid mass is felt. Bilateral solid fixed mass are always suspicious of malignant ovarian tumor. Presence of ascites and adnexal mass is considered malignant until proved otherwise. Please keep these two important rules in your mind. The presence of bilateral solid fixed masses are suspicious and they should be considered malignant until proved otherwise. Presence of ascites and adnexal mass also considered as malignant until proved otherwise, especially in old age. Even in young age, we know that there is a germ cell tumor that is a disease of young age girl. Uh, from history, the patient uh, specific uh, criteria that you should stress for age of the patient is very important. Extreme of age, either old for epithelial malignant ovarian tumor or young for germ cell tumor or any age as sex called stromal tumor. Age group, rapid rate of growth of a mass, pain and loss of weight are always late symptoms. Don't wait, please, for loss of weight and cachexia. Postmenopausal bleeding or symptoms of uh, feminization or virilization, all of these are suspicious. And don't forget, please, family history of similar malignancy or other malignancy. And the past history of the same patient of malignancy elsewhere rather than the offering. By examination, general examination, malignant cachexia and marked and uh, with marked and rapid weight loss and dehydration, palpable supraclavicular lymph node, Burkhaus lymph node should be felt. Uh, proper chest examination for possibility of pleural effusion. Uh, may be present in Nekka syndrome, it is a benign condition, but you should, if there is pleural effusion, you should identify. Associated first mass on Press the examination, yes, proper examination of the press. Any old patient with a, or any patient with adnexal mass, you should examine the press properly, young or old, or old patient. Unilateral leg edema, unilateral pressure by tumor um, with venous or lymphatic obstruction, usually unilateral edema is very suspicious. Bilateral edema could be due to general cause, but unilateral edema is very suspicious, either for malignancy or for possibility of deep vein thrombosis. Unilateral should be taken into consideration. Abdominal examination by inspection, you will find the uh, abdominal distension or sometimes edema with border branch. By palpation, identify the mass if it is pelvic mass or pelvic abdominal, and then full description of the mass during palpation. Uh, when you do percussion, you may find underlying ascites. Pelvic examination, please do proper examination of vaginal fornices for possibility of presence of nodules in the Douglas pouch and uh, possibility to feel tender adnexal mass or if there is one unilateral or bilateral abnormal masses. Sometimes it is difficult due to the presence of peritoneal irritation and causing adhesion. Sometimes you can't feel uh, adnexal mass in obese women or in uh, frozen pelvis with dense adhesion around. Uh, at laparotomy, what is expected to be seen? Uh, ascites is especially on signs of uh, uh, indicating malignancy when you do laparotomy. Ascites, the presence of ascites is very suspicious, especially if it is malignant ascites. Bilateral uh, involvement of post ovaries, bilateral adnexal mass, fixed masses, especially if there is invasion of the capsule or presence of growth, papillae over the external surface. Extra cystic papillae, yes, and adhesions to the surrounding structure. Peritoneal nodules or secondary deposits in omentum, intestine, or liver. Variable consistency of the mass, soft and hard, with areas of hemorrhage and necrosis. And friability is very suspicious of malignancy. How can you proceed for investigation? Pelvic ultrasound is the first and the gold standard. You should be done. And then apply IOTA 
classification for benign condition and the malignant condition. Uh, endometrial keratage, if the woman has thick endometrium or presented with abnormal uterine bleeding, endometrial keratage should be done to exclude possibility of associated endometrial cancer, which could be the primary for which the next and mass represent secondary, or there may be uh, another primary uh, malignancy in the endometrium, uh, as we said before. Chest X-ray is very important. Upper and lower gastrointestinal endoscopy, you may identify a primary tumor in the gastrointestinal tract, especially if there are symptoms suggestive of uh, GIT involvement. Uh, intravenous pyelography, if the mass is large and there is possibility of displacement of the ovary in order to decide if you are in need for insertion of a ureteric stent to minimize the risk of ureteric injury during exploratory laboratory, especially if there is dense adhesion. Uh, paracentesis, however, this is not preferred unless you are in grave doubt about the diagnosis. Paracentesis to take perhaps from the aesthetic field. Uh, spiral CT and magnetic resonance imaging, usually these are helpful in uh, characterization of the nature of the mass, the nature of the content of the mass, possibility of the presence of, of uh, enlarged lymph nodes uh, to give you, you a full uh, picture before you proceed for surgical staging. We do as well tumor markers for possibility of uh, CA125 elevation, which later on will provide a prognostic factor for follow-up of cases. Uh, other uh, domain response to chemotherapy as well, prognostic factor and monitor response to uh, chemotherapy. We may ask for other tumor markers, CA99, calcium embryonic antigen, PTSG, uh, alkaline phosphatase, Lactic dehydrogenase and HE4. Uh, what can we do for early diagnosis of ovarian cancer or early screening of ovarian cancer? Patients are suspicious from the risk factors of the different types should be should be. Uh, uh, taken under consideration, should be properly investigated, should be properly examined if there is any suspicious or doubt about their case. Routine pelvic examination in all premenopausal and postmenopausal women with transvaginal stronger. It's very easy, it's available uh, and, uh, elsewhere and anywhere, it's not expensive as a screening tool if there is any enlarged ovary or it's okay. Periodic transvaginal sonography coupled with serum CA125 and those with enlarged ovary, patient with enlarged ovary do CA125, do MRI, risk of malignant uh, index, apply the uh, RMI to reach to a, a proper diagnosis. Recently, they said that combined CA125 cancer antigen 125 with HE4 has area under the curve of 0.94. What's meant by area under the curve? It is the area of the greatest specificity and sensitivity to uh, uh, give you a high suspicious of either malignancy or uh, the need to proceed for other investigation to confirm your diagnosis, even better than the risk of malignant index. What's the differential diagnosis of ovarian cancer, pelvic masses and abdominal masses, admixal masses, uterine enlargement, colonic uh, masses, retroperitoneal mass. This is uh, common to find uh, a mass wrongly diagnosed as ovarian cancer, even by MRI or spiral CT. And then when you do surgical exploratory laparotomy, you find it is a retroperitoneal mass. It could happen. Abdominal masses, liver, pancreatic, tense ascites, all of these will be excluded completely by uh, surgical uh, exploratory laparotomy. So it's considered as the final diagnosis of ovarian cancer to do exploratory laparotomy. Uh, this can be made at exploratory laparotomy. Uh, it will serve for you the probable diagnosis not only diagnosis, but will provide the primary surgical treatment. 
staging of ovarian cancer is a surgical staging. No place for clinical staging of ovarian cancer. Clinical staging is for cervical cancer, but ovarian cancer is a surgical staging. This is very important, and this is the main way for surgical staging. This entails we do a midline umbilical suprapubic exploratory laparotomy and which the following is performed, exploration of the uh, pelvic and peritoneal cavity, aspiration of any acidic fluid in the uh, cul-de-sac, and if there is no ascites, you should do peritoneal wash and then take cytology. This is very important. This is an essential part in surgical staging of cancer of it. Performing an infracolic omentectomy to exclude the possibility of microscopic metastasis to this area. Stage 3A, microscopic involvement of the omentum or the peritoneal cavity. So we do infracolic omentectomy, especially if there are suspicious pelvic uh, and paraaortic lymph node sampling, and then resection of any visible enlarged nodules elsewhere in the peritoneal cavity. These are the structures to uh, be removed, uh, include the uterus, tubes, ovaries, appendix, omentum, partial resection of if there is extension to any organs like bladder or colon or whatever. And this represented the abnormal next mass, <coughs> the ovarian tumor, the uterus here appear in front, the adnexa, and there is no nodules. Removal of any abnormal nodules that could be seen should be done. Okay, what is the surgical staging of primary epithelial ovarian tumor? We have four stage. It's very easy to memorize, very easy to interpret. Stage one, the tumor is confined to one or both ovaries with or without post-peritoneal cytology. So stage one, the tumor is confined to the ovary with intact capsule. Stage two, the tumor is confined to both ovaries with intact capsule. With capsule intact, there is no external papillae, there is no rupture of the capsule, there is no invasion of the capsule. Stage one, three, there is either involvement of one or both ovaries with poster peritoneal cytology. It differs in the line of management. If you find a case, of stage one malignant ovarian tumors with foster peritoneal cytology at stage one C. So this patient, after performing the primary surgical treatment of panhistrectomy, she should receive post-operative chemotherapy for this peritoneal invasion. At stage one A, the tumor confined to one ovary with intact capsule. Stage one B, the tumor is confined to both ovaries with intact capsule as well. Stage 3, either 1 or 2, with positive peritoneal cytology. And this is the line of treatments, as we said. Surgical, then hysterectomy, total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral cell benzoophorectomy. And if there is stage 1C, the patient should receive additional therapy in the form of chemotherapy. Stage 2, tumor started to go outside the ovary with pelvic extension. This pelvic extension either go with pelvic genital organs in this stage 2 1, including tubes or uterus, or pelvic non genital organs, and this is stage 2 B, including the uh, colon, the uh, rectum, uh, the bladder, any other organs in the pelvis rather than uterus and tube. Both of these could be also with post peritoneal cytology and usually with rupture of. Uh, the capsule by our spread of the tumor cells by exfoliation, as we mentioned before, and transceramic spread. In this case, we have stage 2C, positive peritoneal cytology. Still, here the line of treatment could be uh, operable and could be surgical as well, especially stage 2A. Uh, to be uh, according to the involved organs, if it can be resected completely or not. And usually, this patient in need for surgery and chemotherapy for high risk of residual tissue. Stage three, 
here the tumor involved one or both ovaries with peritoneal implant. Here the tumor start extra pelvic extension. This extra pelvic extension to the peritoneal implant, it could be micros microscopic in stage 3A, and this can be diagnosed by infracolic omentectomy, by omenta perhaps that we, uh, we will take. Or the presence of omenta nodules less than 2 cm stage 3D, or with negative retroperitoneal lymph node, or stage 3 omental nodules, presence of omental nodules more than 2 cm with or without retro, positive retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So stage 3A, here the tumor grossly limited to the two pelvis with negative nodes, but with possibility of microscopic peritoneal or ornamental involvement. Stage 3B, the tumor uh, shows implant less than 2 cm on the abdominal peritoneal surface with negative lymph nodes. Stage 3C, the tumor shows implant more than 2 cm or positive lymph nodes. And in this situation, usually the surface of the liver, if you find the tumor cells on the surface of the liver, it is related to stage 3C, and here the tumor uh, spread by trans spread or by exfoliation of the malignant cells. Uh, usually here the tumor may not be uh, completely resectable, however, debulking the removal of all uh, abnormal tissue or abnormal uh, nodules should be done, and usually uh, post-operative chemotherapy is needed. Stage 4, here there is distant metastasis, pleural effusion, malignant pleural effusion, or involvement of the parenchyma of the liver are considered usually as stage 4. How can you proceed for uh, treatment? As you see, uh, malignant ovarian tumor, uh, if it could be uh, prevented, if it could be early diagnosed, uh, you save the life of your patient, actually. Uh, early stage ovarian cancer, very simple, total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral cell benzoophorectomy, infracolic omentectomy is the standard line of treatment for patient with disease limited to the ovary, no growth evidence of extension beyond the ovary, stage 1 and 2a, no growth evidence of extension beyond the ovary, or actually we do panhysterectomy, so even if there is involvement of the tuber or uterus, they will be removed. Surgical staging is completed via peritoneal wash, please don't forget peritoneal wash is mandatory, and lymph node sampling for microscopic ex uh, assessment of extent of the disease, if they are positive, the patient should receive post-operative chemotherapy. Occasional unilateral cell benzoophorectomy if the tumor is confined to one ovary with intact capsule, no invasion of the capsule, the patient is in young age and need for further fertility, so it is surgically staged as a stage 1a disease with negative peritoneal cytology. Uh, only when the patient is young and fertility is desired, such conditions are mostly met with some early epithelial tumors, borderline tumors or malignant germ cell tumor as this germinoma, or even malignant 6 core stromal tumors. Advanced stage of ovarian cancer, usually primary cytoreductive surgery. We remove all abnormal malignant tissue as possible as we can, initial debulking, sometimes interval debulking, in which the patient receives dose of chemotherapy first, and then followed by scheduled surgery. Uh, second lock surgery and ovarian cancer, this just uh, follow up of your case to exclude the presence of uh, residual tumor. In the past, they uh, used to do a second lock laparotomy or laparoscopy uh, has been advocated in, to assess residual tumor. However, uh, within the abdominal cavity after primary surgery and chemotherapy to decide on further adjuvant therapy or not. But nowadays, follow-up of the case, we are not in need for uh, laparotomy or uh, laparoscopy, but usually we do imaging technique, advanced imaging technique of CT and MRI, and sometimes uh, cancer engine 125, if it is positive or high from the start. It has 
a very important prognostic factor. If you find negative imaging, and in spite of this rising uh, cancer and sugar 125, here this is an indication to do laparotomy or second look laparotomy or laparoscopy. If we have rising the tumor marker and negative imaging. If there is any, uh, any abnormalities or abnormal tumor cross seen by uh, imaging, so no need, no need for uh, uh, second look laparoscopy or laparotomy will do, uh, we will proceed directly for treating this residual according to its place, according to the condition of the patient, uh, and according to the potential allowed if it is surgery or chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy could be single or uh, multiple agents, usually it is for advanced disease or those with uh, possible peritoneal cytology. Uh, early stage of the disease, usually it is of limited use, being treated mostly surgical, unless the tumor is fully differentiated or positive peritoneal cytology. Late stage of the disease, if the uh, tumor uh, after primary cytoreductive debulking surgery, most of them in advanced case of the disease receive post-operative chemotherapy, new adjuvant chemotherapy before interval debulking, as we mentioned before, or sometimes palliative in inoperable cases or recurrent cases. Types of chemotherapy used, uh, either single uh, chemotherapy or double. Uh, it is usually used for four to five uh, uh, sessions with three to four weeks interval. Uh, cisplatin and carboplatin are commonly used alone or in combination with uh, Taxol, also Avastin sometimes used according to the regimen uh, planned for by specialist chemical therapists actually deal with uh, the post-operative chemotherapy of malignant patients. Chemotherapeutic agents are highly toxic at therapeutic doses. Even therapeutic doses are highly toxic and so they should be given with great care. The dose is calculated uh, by meticulous way and need close monitoring during treatment cycle. Uh, the patient is asked to tell if there is any uh, ominous signs start to develop before giving the uh, second dose. And that's why it should be spaced three to four weeks apart between the planned uh, individual doses. A radiation therapy for malignant uh, ovarian cancer has dated place in epithelial ovarian, as we said, it is be being chemosensitive. It may be used as adjuvant therapy following cytoreductive surgery in patients who are refused or are not good candidate for chemotherapy. This germinoma was reduced sensitive, as we said before. Two types of uh, radiation therapy is used, either intraperitoneal radioactive colloids or total beam external abdominal radiation. What about the prognosis of ovarian cancer? It depends upon the different factors, the pathological type of the tumor, the histological grading of the tumor, staging, surgical staging of the tumor, age of the patient, general condition of the patient, the, uh, decree, the line of management done, if uh, the tumor is resectable or not resectable, surgical, com sur complete surgical excision of all malignant tissue or the tumor was uh, was not uh, completely resected. And if there is uh, chemosensitive, chemosensitive or radiosensitive, or the tumor is chemoresistant, all of these are very important and signify uh, the prognostic uh, factors for the malignant tumor. Five year survival rate in epithelial ovarian cancer, stage one. 85 up to 90 percent, stage 2, 80 percent, stage 3, 15 to 20 percent, stage 4, only 5 percent. So uh, this tumor is usually of poor prognosis and late diagnosed if we apply the uh, proper uh, follow-up uh, examination for early diagnosis of any abnormality and apply a proper knowledge for the patient about the importance of a regular checkup for diagnosis of early malignancy. You will provide great care for your patient and prevent these late sequelae of poor prognostic and uh, uh, very uh, deep.
ذلك دي فيتاليزنج اور دي كابيتيتنج اكشولي هيلث هازارد ثانك يو اند اي هوبفولي هاف جود لك باي باي